is actually my third TED Talk, uh, which is hard to believe. Um, but that means I'm doing it my way. <laughs> and I've uh, given, most of my TED Talks are about uh, my specialty, which is I'm an urban designer. And I talk about urban design. I talk about the walkable city. Uh, but the problem is that I grew up to be, and I was educated to be, an architect. And architecture is, is really um, my first love. But I uh, never got licensed as an architect. And so I have to call myself, technically, legally, I have to say architecture is my hobby. Now, I have managed to design a few buildings that uh, got built, exactly a few. But more importantly, I really I feel like an architect. I have many of the you know, personal habits, the wardrobe, uh, <laughs> the anxieties, the hopes, the dreams uh, of an architect. And the biggest dream of those probably was to someday uh, design my own house. Now, it's the classic young architect move. If you're super rich like Philip Johnson, you get to do it while you're still in graduate school. If you're kind of rich like Robert Venturi, you get to do it for your mother when you're in your 30s. Um, I was already 40, and I'd moved to Washington, D.C., when I finally had enough cash to get myself an empty lot to build on. But I really couldn't afford a normal lot. I could only afford the kind of lot you might find in, in Marshalls in the irregular bin. <laughs> Happily, this, this limitation jibed well with my other goal, which was to make a home that was truly of its city. Now, those of you who know your city plans, um, what is it that makes the plan for Washington so special? It's actually all the diagonal avenues that slice up the street grid like a mad chef at Benihana. <laughs> now, most cities have rectilinear grids, um, and some cities have diagonals. But before the plan for Washington, there was actually no city that combined the two together as its main theme. Now, this is actually super inefficient, creates a ton of wasted space, and results in a bunch of triangular lots that are really hard to build upon. You know this kind of lot, right? <laughs> In New York City, where one street, Broadway, cuts across the grid, uh, it creates buildings like these. We, we call them flat irons. In Washington, D.C., flat irons are everywhere. Now, why did L'Enfant do this? My theory is that he was trying to merge the two fundamental political philosophies underlying this new nation, federalism and republicanism. Now, federalism, which was championed by Alexander Hamilton, was all about centralized authority, the consolidation of power in the capital, an approach which is appropriately uh, represented by the sort of hub and spoke system that you find in authoritarian landscapes like Versailles. Republicanism, which was championed by Thomas Jefferson, um, was the opposite. It was about the democratization of power and about the distribution of that power widely and evenly. No surprise, then, that Jefferson's own plan, which he drew uh, for the new capital, was a simple grid. Now, L'Enfant, rather than choosing between these two models, chose to put them both together. And as a result, Washington, D.C. has not just a couple flat iron lots, but, but literally hundreds. Now, the larger ones are quite easy to build upon and often beautifully, but many of them are unbuilt upon, especially the smaller ones. In fact, a large number of lots, according to DC zoning, when I arrived in the early 2000s, were technically illegal uh, to build upon. The zoning code, which like most codes of its era was imported from the suburbs, uh, refused to acknowledge that even, you know, that, that any lot could exist that had two fronts. Now, my plan, was to find one of these, buy it super cheap, and then change the zoning in order to put a house on it. <laughs> Which I do, I'm a city planner. So, the first step was to create a map of the city, quadrant by quadrant, and to map out all of the different flat iron lots. At which point, I'd rent, I'd rent the zip car, my girlfriend Alice, now my wife, would drive, and we'd visit, we'd check them all out. And we did this over weekends, it took a couple months. At the end of that search, I had found exactly zero flat iron lots that weren't either too small or too expensive for me to build upon. And we were about to give up when I got a call from my friend Josh. And Josh said, hey, Jeff, have you seen this lot, the one at the very tip of the L'Enfant plan? It looks like a good choice. And I checked it out, and there it was, and we visited, and it was pretty perfect. But was it available? So a trip to the planning office revealed that it wasn't one lot, 
but actually two lots, both impossibly tiny. The lot in the corner, number 95, belonged to one Vincent Toomey, who I was able to reach and who was willing to sell it to me for the price of one quarter of a normal lot. The second lot, number 94, belonged to Samuel Hankins, who was not answering my letters. Now, I can't buy one lot without the other, right? I can't build a house on 241 square feet. So we kept looking for Mr. Hankins, and we spent months. He had four different addresses that he was not located at. And we were about to give up last-ditch effort. We hired a private detective. <laughs> now, he spent about two months looking and then returned the deposit, said, Mr. Hankins can't be found. At that point, I got a call back from Mr. Toomey, who said, Jeff, are you still interested in my lot? Because someone else wants to buy it. Now, this was a total lie. So I did the smart thing, and I said no. Actually, I didn't. Because I wasn't thinking with my brain, I was thinking with, uh, let's call it little Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright. And little Frank was telling me that I could put a house on that lot. And at that, at that moment, the tiny house movement was, was growing, right? You heard about this tiny house movement. And I said, I can put a tiny house on that lot. And I designed this three-story house to go on that lot. Never mind, you know, that it violated the zoning tremendously and that my family would grow out of it in three years when we had a kid. You know, I was going to do something on that lot. And, you know, besides my plan, which had an entry floor, a living floor, and a sleeping floor, it wasn't that far off the zoning. I just had to double the allowable amount of square footage and get the city engineer to rule that the second and third floors, which were cantilevered, were just one single bay window. Now, how hard could that be? <laughs> so, encouraged, I moved forward. I pushed the plan forward. I eventually got a meeting with the city engineer. And of course, you already know, it was a total fail. I had spent half my savings on a completely worthless lot. But then I got a call back from the private investigator. He said, Jeff, I found one more address for Samuel Hankins. And I ran to the zip car, drove out to his home, found him there on a Sunday. Uh, he was a retired postal clerk who had bought it at the tax auction years ago for $8,000. And we sat down and we made a deal on the spot. And that was a great day to be me. <laughs> and I don't smoke cigars. <laughs> so that's, that's the last cigar I've smoked. So now I had a lot. I had a whopping 552 square foot lot, and I got to work. So my first goal with the design was to celebrate being at the tip of the L'Enfant plan. It was going to be as pointy a house as possible. And we eventually ended up casting a 34 degree corner brick in order to accomplish that. Secondly, I wanted you to feel the clashing geometries of the two streets. I wanted you to be able to feel Florida Street when you were on 10th Street, and I wanted you to be able to feel 10th Street when you were on Florida Street. And then thirdly, I didn't want to have many triangular rooms, because they're really not very comfortable. That led to a scheme what we architectural hobbyists call a partee of a rectangle, a wood rectangle, dropped inside a brick triangle, which led to two residual volumes, a triangle at the tip, which became a wood-burning stove and its chase, and a triangle at the end, which became the stairway. I then, as a last move, kind of pulled a second hidden rectangle through the triangle in order to create balconies on the quiet side of the house. Now, this plan also doubled the allowable square footage of the lot, but I had confidence that the Board of Zoning Appeals would agree that this, this empty lot, you know, this missing tooth, deserved to have a building on it, as the code should have allowed. Now, being a hobbyist, I didn't do this alone. It was very much a team effort. Every detail was worked out in conjunction uh, with two other people. One of them is Pierre Viget, who's a builder, of tremendous skill and conscientiousness and conscience, I would add. Um, the other was Brie Husted, who is a real architect, and she actually did the blueprints, which means she had to turn my, my ideas into reality. Maybe some of you knew Brie. Uh, she died, tragically, uh, three and a half years ago, uh, much too young. She was the architect of a number of restaurants you probably enjoy in DC. Uh, including El Centro and Maza 14. Um, I hope she's also remembered for this house, because honestly, I, I designed the model, but she designed the house. So let's do a little, a little walk through. Um, you enter on the ground floor, and you're met with what turned out to be four identical doors uh, next to the stairway. Here's a couple of them. Uh, my son Mila was born right after <laughs> we moved in. Um, and room by room, it's my home office, 
a closet, a bathroom, and then the one room that can take advantage of being triangular, which is a little media room in the corner. And that used to be a big TV, if you remember. So <laughs> here's my office next to the stair, which passes by the office. The stair is really its own room, and I had it cast in raw steel uh, as its own structure, and the internal rail is actually a disassociated spiral column. And it was manufactured in Minnesota and then brought out and built on site by a family uh, from Minnesota. This broke the bank, but it was my first house, and I was going to have it all with a construction loan to prove it. Um, the main floor is all one room, living, dining, kitchen. The corner of the living room, which is a cantilever, is meant to read as both the completion of a square room and as a bay window in a triangular room. This is what my architecture professor first year called a multivalent reading. And I hope it's visible that you can see it either way. Here's the wood-burning stove in the point of the house and viewing back through the dining and kitchen areas. Here you see leaning into the kitchen uh, a landing of the stair that I made an extra foot long. So it's also a shelf in the kitchen. I'm always interested in stairs that can be things that are more than stairs. Is it a shelf or is it a stair? Yes, it is. <laughs> Upstairs, you have the landing with a closet, a master bedroom, a nursery, and an inline bathroom, creating a donut arrangement that's actually very convenient for young parents. And then in the, in the bedroom, here's the chase of the wood-burning stove, which gathers a tremendous amount of heat when the stove is going and comes in through that awning window. The roof is a butterfly rising up over the main volume, but also up over the staircase, which means it drains down the corner of the stair in this iron pipe. Because the house covered its entire lot, it had to drain itself through itself. Here's the balconies, one of the balconies um, on the quiet side that required a variance in addition to all the additional square feet. We had one of the variants we had to get, which is that we were required to park a car on our site by the old zoning code. Now, Never mind that none of my neighbors had garages, right? And that everyone parked on street. I was required by the code to actually destroy a historic curb, remove an on-street parking space, and then recreate it on my lot, turning a public good into a private good. Never mind that we were you know, three blocks from Metro and that we used Zipcar. I brought this photo to my zoning hearing, and that was a nine-month process to get rid of the garage. It became a national news story that I didn't want a garage on my lot. But such was the travesty of DC zoning um, back then. But what can I say, uh, it all worked out, and we ended up with a nice, warm home. Thank you. The pleasure is mine. But we, uh, we ended up with a nice, warm home, uh, both for a growing family and for, for gathering up our neighbors, despite its, uh, its small size. So a question that's often asked in design school is, what is it that separates architecture from, from mere building? And what I was taught and what I believe is that architecture is building that's driven by an idea. That idea should really go beyond mere shelter and function. It should even go beyond beauty. You know, just as all serious art these days is in some ways conceptual art, all architecture is conceptual building. And a real piece of architecture is a building about a concept. This is a building about a whole bunch of concepts. It's about celebrating the quintessential Washington, D.C. lot, the Flatiron, and marking the tip of the L'Enfant plan. It's about feeling the clash of geometries when streets come together at unusual angles. It's about what happens when you drop a rectangle into a triangle. It's about multivalent readings. It's a little bit about uh, how bad D.C. zoning used to be. You know, it was my first house. I wasn't going to just settle on one concept. That's the architectural side. On the personal side, it's really about how you know, a grown man can make a bunch of bad choices, make, take stupid risks, and spend four years chasing an unlikely dream, yet somehow end up planting something unique in the soil of this city that he loves. And I hope you like it too. Thank you.